This is a tutorial video on approaches to making Zen harmonic, also known as microtonal music. Zen harmonic music uses different tunings, scales, and chords that aren't accessible using the 12 tone equal tempered scale that pretty much all Western musicians use. These new tunings open up a ton of new musical possibility, which can sometimes sound really strange and alien, but you can also access notes that offer new twists on familiar sounding chords and scales. For instance, new flavors of major and minor triads, or minor scales that sound a little bit darker and weirder. Music can also be made to sound more dissonant too, so essentially you can go further out on the spectrum of consonance or dissonance. Making music outside of the confines of regular 12 tone equal temperament can be really exciting and it also doesn't have to be difficult. As long as you understand some basic concepts, you can kind of let your ears guide you the rest of the way. So here's a few examples of possibilities in Zen harmonic tuning systems. I'm going to use one of my Zen harmonic songs for the tutorial. It's called Kaleidoscopic. Uh, That's the thing playing in the background. It's on my album Neutral Paradise, um, which has a bunch of other songs that are all in different Zen harmonic tunes, if you're curious. I'll also be using Logic Pro because it has a really easy to use tuning window, but I also use a program called Custom Scale Editor by HPI Instruments to retune other third-party virtual synths and this tuning box that allows me to retune an analog synthesizer but you can start making your own microtonal music just by using the tuning window in Logic. And there's a few other great programs out there that do similar things and can help you retune. So this track that I'm using in the tutorial uses what's called adjust intonation tuning. I'm gonna be focusing on the creation and use of this tuning in the tutorial, but before I get into all of that, I also wanted to mention the use of different equal temperaments, um, which is also very popular in the microtonal community. There are a bunch of equal temperaments which are really amazing and musically valid and they all have their own unique properties and quirks. For example, I use 22 tone equal temperament quite a bit and I actually have a band that plays exclusively in this tuning system. 22 Edo divides the octave into 22 equal steps rather than the 12 equal steps that you would find on a regular piano or a guitar. You get all sorts of cool chords and scales with this tuning and it can sound a lot different um, in a really pleasant and intriguing way. You can split up the octave into as many or as few divisions as you want and each Edo is its own little universe that offers its own unique possibilities. Here's a few examples. For this tutorial, I'm going to focus on the just intonation scale that I used for this song, but there's a lot of ways to go about making microtonal music, and I'm really just scratching the surface in this video, so hopefully it inspires you to do a bit of your own research. 
So a just intonation scale like the one we'll be using here uses intervals derived directly from the harmonic series. Harmonic series can help you understand a lot about microtonality, so let's dive in and start with a quick crash course on that. So I'm going to start by playing this note E down here on the keyboard, and you can see up in the EQ that we have all of the frequencies that are components of this timbre, or of this sound. So the lowest frequency we have here is called the fundamental frequency. So the fundamental basically just tells our brain uh, what note is being played on that particular instrument. This is what tells us what pitch we're hearing. The frequencies on top are called the partials, also known as harmonics. These are the same frequencies here, represented as notes on a staff, and this is the harmonic series. We can use these frequencies to create and conceptualize different microtonal tunings, and the relationship of these also uh, plays a large part in creating the timbre of different instruments. So for example, let's take a listen to the difference between a keyboard and a clarinet and look at the harmonics. So the keyboard sound is on top, clarinet's on the bottom. You can see that they both have the same harmonics, uh, present in the sound. The fundamental is the same, but the volume level between the harmonics are different. You can see that the clarinet sound is actually missing some of the partials that are on the keyboard sound, but a key difference is that the volume levels between the harmonics are different. So this is partly how we can distinguish between two different instruments playing the same note. Okay, so the point I really wanted to make is that when we play a note on an instrument, we're actually hearing a chord. And a chord is just a bunch of different frequencies played at once. But this chord is tuned differently than chords you can play on a regular piano or guitar or whatever. It has notes that you can't find on traditional instruments that sort of fall between the keys or between the frets. Uh, but they're actually really consonant and natural sounding and very musically useful and interesting. So let's take a listen to what it sounds like if we retune a keyboard to play these notes that we find in the harmonic series. Here's a chord. Let's take a listen to the actual partials present in this keyboard sound. So uh, I'm just going to be using this note G sharp, which I actually pitched down a little bit so that the fundamental shows up right at 100 hertz. And the reason I did that is I want to make it clear that there's this very simple mathematical relationship between the fundamental and the partials. So if you want to figure out the second partial, you just take the fundamental frequency and multiply it by 2. So you see there is this frequency right at 200. If you want to know the third partial, you just multiply the fundamental by 3. If you want to know the fifth partial, you multiply by 5. So you see this um, 500 hertz frequency showing up right there. Um, and that goes on pretty much into infinity, theoretically. And this is the structure for harmonic sounds. Harmonic sounds are generally made by instruments that are good at playing melodies or chord progressions. So strings, guitars, the human voice, etc. In harmonic sounds, which are things like drums and percussion, have a more chaotic partial structure that doesn't follow the harmonic series. Some instruments have both harmonic and inharmonic partials, but that's another subject, and we're just going to focus on the harmonic partials for now. So I'm going to play just the note by itself, and I'm going to boost the fifth partial. And you'll notice it's already there. I'm just boosting the volume. And you notice that it's actually a different pitch than the fundamental. And if you've had any ear training courses or anything like that, you probably heard that that's a major third. This major third is actually 14 cents flatter than the major third you would find in equal temperament. So if we retune a piano, um, let's, let's take a listen to the difference between those sounds. First, let's go to the tuning window, which is under File, Project Settings, and Tuning. This window just allows you to globally tune all of your Logic software instruments. So why don't we take a listen to uh, a major third and equal tone temperament first, 12 tone equal temperament, so from C to E. It's the one we're used to hearing. Now let's compare that with the major third that we find in the harmonic series between the fourth and fifth partial. So I'm tuning that E down 14 cents. Compared to equal tempered, down 14 cents. So it might sound kind of subtle, and it is. Uh, these differences are going to get uh, more obvious in microtonal as we go, but you might be able to hear that there's 
kind of a buzz to it. Uh, sounds a little bit more solid, a little bit more in tune. All right, let's boost the volume of the sixth partial. So that's a perfect fifth. And if I play a third and a fifth, if you've had any music theory uh, training, you know root third and a fifth gives you a major chord. So this is actually just uh, sort of highlighting the fact that there's a major chord present in the timbre of this uh, keyboard sound. Okay, so now for sort of the, the microtonal intervals. This is the uh, seventh partial and it gives us a minor seventh between the fundamental and that seventh partial and this minor seventh is actually pitched down 31 cents compared to the one that we would find on a regular uh, piano or guitar or whatever so let's listen to that C to B flat that's the minor seventh we're used to hearing let's turn this B flat down 31 cents Try it on a different timbre real quick. Compared with. Let's add that major third in. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this is the 11th partial, and this gives us a, basically a perfect quarter tone, right between a perfect fourth and a tritone. So there's the regular timbre. Let's boost the 11th partial. All right, so let's hear what happens when we tune that on a piano. So there's that perfect fourth that we're used to hearing. Let's tune this F up for, or sorry, 51 cents. So you might think that sounds kind of gnarly, and I wouldn't disagree with you, but in the context of some chords, it can sound cool and in tune in a weird way. on a different timbre. While we're here, I'm just gonna show you what the 13th harmonic sounds like when retuned on a keyboard. I'm gonna add 41 cents to that A flat. Kind of crazy sounding, but... Microtonalists use ratios to describe different types of intervals or interval sizes. We get the ratios directly from the harmonic series, and the numbers also represent the proportion of the different frequencies of each pitch. They don't imply any specific notes, just the size of the interval. So, for example, if we take the fourth partial and play it against the fifth partial, in this case that's the notes C to E, which is a major third, we get that slightly flat but solid sounding major third that we talked about before. We refer to that as a 5 to 4 because we're talking about the interval size that we find between the 5th partial and the 4th partial. Microtonalists actually consider a 5 to 4 sort of like a, a true major third, and the major third we find in equal tone, you know, 12 tone equal temperament, we actually consider it to be 14 cents sharp, so it's actually kind of turned on its head there. Another example would be a 7 to 4. So we would take the 7th partial and measure it against the 4th partial. This is that minor 7th that has the 7th tuned down about 31 cents compared to 12 tone equal. 
So as long as you have that size interval um, or something, you know, close to it, we would consider that a seven to four. One of the cool things that um, ratios kind of opens you up to is that there can be different sort of flavors or different intonations of the same interval. For example, you could have two different types of minor thirds. If we look at this minor third between the sixth and the fifth partial, we see that we get a minor third that is 16 cents sharper than the one that we usually find in 12 tone equal temperament. So here's the minor third we're used to hearing. Let's take this up 16 cents. Slightly brighter, slightly more in tune sounding. If we compare that to a seven to six minor third, we can see that this one is actually 33 cents flatter. Take this down 33 cents. Much darker. But melodically, it's still the same interval. So between those two variations, we have an almost 40 cent difference in their intonation, but both are in tune in a sense. They're melodically the same interval, um, but they each have their own color to them. Okay, uh, one more just since I'm going to refer to it a lot um, is the 11 to 8. So 11 to 8 means we're referring to the distance between the 11th partial and the 8th partial. So you can see the 8th partial, you know, that's just C again. That's just, you know, the C just a couple octaves up and that 51 cent sharp um, F. So that's the perfect fourth that we're used to hearing. Let's tune it up by about 50 cents. So it falls right in between a perfect fourth and a tritone. To my ears, the 11 to 8 or a super fourth or whatever you want to call it is kind of a new interval. It can sound out of tune or wrong at first, but after some exposure to it, it can sound very natural and pleasing. Last thing on ratios, um, there are just a ton of interesting intervals and chords that can be derived from the harmonic series, and in a way that can be thought of as having a kind of consonance to them, um, at least in some musical contexts because the notes have this simple mathematical relationship to each other, the simple ratios, and they're reflective of intervals that are found in this naturally occurring phenomenon of the harmonic series. One concept about these ratios is that you can sort of assume that the simpler the ratio is, the more consonant the interval will be. So for example, a three to two, which is a perfect fifth, will be perceived as being more consonant than let's say a seven to five, which is a J.I. tritone. This isn't always the case, and it can depend on context, but it is a good rule of thumb. So with that, let's move on. I wanted to briefly go back to different equal temperaments, now that you have an understanding of just intonation and ratios. So equal temperaments, including 12-tone equal temperament, offer approximations of different J.I. ratios. So the reason that most of the Western world uses 12-tone equal temperament is because it approximates a good number of simple ratios, like the 3 to 2 perfect fifth, the 5 to 4 major third, um, even though that one's 14 cents sharp, like we saw before. So other equal temperaments, such as 22 Edo, which we're looking at here, can approximate other ratios not offered in 12 Edo. And in some cases, they can do better uh, than 12 Edo. For example, the major third is tuned closer to an exact 5 to 4 pure major third. It's more in tune. And you get some of the other cool intervals that we've been talking about, like the harmonic 7th, the 7 to 4, uh, the 11 to 8, the 7 to 6, and a lot of other ones. And they're all tuned close enough to be convincing approximations of those intervals. Equal temperaments are a compromise, but in return you get the ability to transpose, there can be more available chords and keys, and it's generally simpler to use, just like 12-tone equal temperament. And they're a lot of fun, and definitely worth trying out for yourself. So for the scale I used in this song, I chose the root, E, and every other pitch I tuned against this E, so I have J-I relationships between the other pitches, the other keys, and the note E. 
So let's go through them really quickly. And even though we used E as the root, that doesn't mean we can't get uh, other chords and things like that, but we'll go over that in a minute. So we have a smaller semitone, 22 to 21. This is a nine to eight, also known as the octave reduced ninth harmonic. There's that flat minor third from before, seven to six. There's a purely tuned major third, five to four. There's the 11 to eight, the octave reduced 11th harmonic. It's a seven to five, J.I. tritone. Perfect fifth. A subminor sixth, also known as 11 to seven. This is a Pythagorean uh, major sixth, 27 to 16. There's a harmonic seventh, it's from before, seven to four. There's a 11 to sixth, a neutral seventh. It's not quite a major seventh, not quite a minor seventh. So now we have a bunch of kind of weirdly sized intervals. We definitely have a tuning that doesn't sound like an equal temperament. Um, and we have all these intervals that are now kind of asymmetrically tuned to each other. And some of them are tuned to um, the simple J-I ratios that we've been talking about. Um, some are not, but we still get a lot of usable chords and they all kind of have an interesting color to them. I'm going to play these chords for you just to give you an idea of some of the possibilities. But I'm not going to go into the crazier sounding Zen harmonic stuff, kind of like this. So while chords like that sound really cool to me, I still want to just focus on the more familiar sounding stuff to start out. Uh, these are just chords that I thought sounded good and I probably missed a bunch, but you'll still notice that there are way fewer chords available in this tuning that sound conventionally good compared to 12 tone equal temperament. The trade-off is that the chords sound unique and new and interesting. So yes, this scale is kind of limiting, but for me personally, I like working within those kinds of limits, um, at least for a few songs before moving on, and it can kind of push you to go places compositionally that you might not have gone to otherwise, um, if you were using a more flexible scale or tuning. So if things like transposition and modulation are important in your music, then you might be happier using an equal temperament or a more expanded just intonation scale. But this isn't a bad place to start if you're getting into this for the first time. Um, so let's have a listen to the chords. Okay, let's finally get into the song here. I'm going to show you the chords for both the verse and the chorus, and I'm just going to point out the more interesting Zen harmonic microtonal moments in each part uh, between the melody and the accompaniment. So let's start with the verse. <laughs> So here on the piano roll is the accompaniment, and then down here is the lead. I'm just going to focus on these two elements because this is pretty much what I use to write the song. And then after I had these dialed in, I you know, built it out with um, accompaniment and orchestration and stuff like that. 
So all of these are just chords that have been arpeggiated. Here's the first one. So I start out with an E power chord. It's not major or minor. And remember, we built the scale off of E. So this allows me the freedom to kind of hit any of those notes and they'll probably sound kind of cool. So this first part of the melody, I'm really hammering on this uh, neutral seventh quite a bit. And I also have that 11 to eight or that super augmented fourth in play as well. So this whole first phrase kind of has a neutral feel to it. And then the second phrase, uh, the rhythm, you know, is pretty much exactly the same, same phrase. But then I get kind of into a more Lydian uh, major, which, you know, kind of has more of a resolved familiar sound to it. So I start with that J I tritone, but then I hit that major third, and that major third really helps give it a nice uh, consonant major sound. Um, and then I end actually with a seven to four, so that gives it more of an E7 sound, but it's the harmonic seven, so it has that nice J-I buzz to it. So let's listen to that first phrase. So for this next chord, uh, G minor or G minor seven, I'm actually using two different flavors of G minor. Um, I didn't show you this before, but in the tuning window, you'll notice that G is tuned 33 cents flat and the A is tuned 50 cents sharp. So even though we're playing a whole step shape on the keyboard, this gives us a minor third melodically. And it's kind of a flat one. Remember we also had the, the sharper, brighter one, the six to five. So melodically it's still the same interval, but we have a darker and a brighter one. In the melody you can see here, I use that A instead of B flat. Um, here's G right here. So we have just kind of a, a G minor seven with the, the flatter minor third. And then right here when the melody ascends, I change it to B flat. So it's pretty subtle, but these are this is one of the kind of neat things you can do um, in microtonality. This next chord I'm gonna kind of blow through. It's just uh, an F minor. Um, but it's actually pretty much an equal tempered sound. There's not much microtonality going on there. So let me play through these. So for this next little section of the verse, I'm bouncing back and forth between C minor seven and A flat major or A flat major seven. The C minor seven actually makes use of a harmonic seventh. So here we have C and I'm hitting the note A here, but remember we are sort of using that uh, A on the keyboard and B flat on the keyboard as interchangeable versions of the same note. So the C minor seven takes advantage of that as well. So here we have our C, which is down about uh, you know 17 or 18 cents, and then our A note is up 50 cents. So between those two, we get that familiar sounding, or at least now it's familiar sounding to you, harmonic seventh instead of. So again, we kind of have choices there. We also have a seven to six minor third between that C and this E flat. You can see that's down 51 cents. This is down, you know, 17 or 18, and that gives us pretty much a seven to six. Um, these ratios, you know, you can be off a couple cents um, and it, it'll still have that kind of J-I sound. So we have our C minor seven chord with the harmonic seventh and the seven to six. Then we're going to A flat major. One of the things that sticks out to me is this, moving to that, going back down. So it's functioning as the seventh in the C minor chord, but then I'm using the sharper B flat in the A flat major seven chord. So that's functioning as the ninth. So these are the kinds of things that I often choose to accentuate or highlight with orchestration. Uh, you know, maybe have a pad that doubles those notes or creates some sort of accompaniment line. And these kind of micro shifts or tiny intervals can be really cool to create subtle motion between chords. And it's something you can't really do in 12 tone equal temperament while still matching, uh, you know, the intonations and the harmonies in each chord. And all of these notes are sort of moving, you know, between each other asymmetrically, which is one of the things that I really like about Zen music. But here's kind of a really obvious example. So maybe focus in on that when I play it here. This next chord is another G minor, or G minor seven. 
So nothing too interesting there, but in the melody, again, we have that option to use the flatter version of B flat or the sharper one. I opted for the flatter one. Uh, I'll play both options for you. And here's option B. I should say option B flat. So really subtle, but to me, this version sounds a little bit more interesting, a little bit darker, a little bit more mysterious. So that's it for the verse. Let's take a look at the uh, chorus. So the chorus has one chord in particular that I want to focus on that kind of has the most interesting Zen harmonic or microtonal moments. Uh, but I'll play the whole thing for you and show you the chords. Just so you know, um, down here uh, is the bass line. We also have the accompaniment here, this kind of arpeggiated thing, which is a very similar timbre to what I used in the verse. And then on top we have the lead line. So we're gonna analyze these three elements, um, but let's take a listen to it first. And so on and so forth. So the most interesting chord in this progression is probably the last one, which is based off of this A note. And remember, this has been pitched up by 50 cents. So essentially what's happening is all of these notes playing against it become neutral intervals, which just to clarify generally means that the tuning of the interval falls in the gray area between a minor interval and a major interval, like between a minor second and a major second. These intervals can also blur the line between major and minor tonality as well if you're using neutral thirds like we have here between that C sharp and that A that's been tuned up by 50 cents. Sounds almost like a major third, but kind of sounds like a minor third too. So I'll play this section without the drums and then we can analyze things in more detail. So I think of this chord as an inversion of this cluster of notes. And remember, we base the scale off of E, so we have J-I relationships between these notes. Um, so let's take a look at how that relates uh, when A is in the bass. So the first thing we have is a 16 to 11. This is just the inversion of the 11 to 8, which we've been looking at. The inversion is a 16 to 11. Here we have a neutral sixth. This is a 18 to 11. This is actually just the inversion of 11 to 9, which is uh, the neutral third that we were looking at before. So not quite major, not quite minor. Next we have a neutral seventh. It's not quite a minor seventh. It's not quite a major seventh. This is a 20 to 11, which is the inversion of an 11 to 10 which is a neutral second. So this is not quite a minor second, not quite a major second. The inversion gives us a neutral seventh. And lastly, we have that uh, neutral third that we were looking at before. So between A and C sharp, let's do it down here. This is actually closer to a 16 to 13 GI ratio, but it's still a neutral third. So together, This chord sort of has a weird consonance to it because we're used to hearing these intervallic relationships in harmonic timbres, just like we were looking at before. It's odd to hear notes tuned this way on a keyboard, but they have this blending quality that can make them sound more consonant than you might expect. And in certain musical contexts like this one, you can use them to create new sounding chords. Mm -hmm. 
So I hope this video has been helpful to you, and uh, I definitely encourage every musician to give this tuning stuff a try. Um, there's a ton of resources out there, and again, I've sort of just scratched the surface with this stuff. There's tons more to explore. There's also a lot of great Zen harmonic music out there um, that's definitely worth listening to um, in almost every style, electronic, metal, orchestral, there's kind of something for everybody. So um, hopefully this has inspired you to do your own research, and if anybody has any questions, uh, just leave them in the comments section. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Um, but again, thank you for watching and for listening. Until next time.